Hello, Val Andy here, your host at the Galaxy Report, with today's story that alters our knowledge of the planet Earth, the Milky Way, and the vast cosmos beyond. Life on Earth does not proceed in isolation. In addition to being Earthlings, we're citizens of a larger cosmos, and sometimes that cosmos intrudes on our lives, says astronomer Brian Fields at the University of Illinois. Every century, about two massive stars in our Milky Way explode, produce a magnificent supernova, in the universe at large, a supernova event occurs every second. Stephen Hawking believed that these massive explosions may be responsible for killing off advanced extraterrestrial civilizations. Perhaps, he thought, a major factor in the great silence of the Fermi paradox. Now, let's flash back to February 1987, when Niels Gerls, then a young researcher at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, boarded a military plane bound for the remote Australian outback, carrying some peculiar cargo, a polyethylene space balloon and a set of radiation detectors he had just finished building back at the lab. Garrow's later a renowned global figure as chief of the Goddard Space Flight Center Astroparticle, Astroparticle Physics Laboratory, passed away mysteriously at, on February 6, 2017. He was hoping to gather evidence that answered the question of how close a supernova needs to be to devastate life on Earth by annihilating the ozone layer, exposing plants and animals to harmful ultraviolet light, and possibly cause a new mass extinction. Armed with new data from Supernova 1987A, that's the supernova that Johannes Kepler spotted in, one of our, own, in our own Milky Way galaxy in 1604, Gernels could calculate a theoretical radius of doom inside which a supernova would have grievous effects on Earth. The bottom line was that there would be a supernova close enough to Earth to drastically affect the ozone layer, about once every billion years, says Gerls. A supernova event eight million years ago created atmospheric ionization that triggered an enormous upsurge in cloud-to-ground lightning strikes on Earth, igniting forest fires around the globe. These infernos could be one reason ancestors of Homo sapiens developed bipedalism to adapt on savannas that, re that replaced torched forests in Northeast Africa, leading proto-humans to walk on two legs, eventually resulting in Homo sapiens with hands free to build cathedrals, design rockets, and snap iPhone selfies. Over the last 13 million years, observes PBS, 16 massive stars collapsed and then spectacularly exploded in our galactic neighborhood, leaving a, a gigantic cavity of hot gas in her wake. Using radioactive dust buried globally at the bottom of oceans, scientists have identified the location and dates of the closest of these supernovas. These massive fireworks from the supermassive stars littered our planet with radioactive cosmic dust, which in the end may have altered human evolution. Adrian Malot, Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Kansas, makes the case that supernova bombarded Earth with cosmic energy starting as many as 8 million years ago, with a peak at some 2.6 million years, initiating an avalanche of electrons in the lower atmosphere and setting off a chain of events that feasibly ended with bipedal hominids such as Homo habilis, dubbed the handyman. It's thought that there was already some tendency for hominids to walk on two legs, said Malo, even before this event. But they were mainly adapted for climbing, in, or climbing around trees, climbing in trees, and after this conversion to savanna, they would be much more often to have to walk from one tree to another across the grassland. And so they became better at walking upright. They could see over the tops of grass and watch for predators. It's thought that this conversion to savanna contributed to bipedalism as it became more and more dominant in human ancestors. Based on a telltale layer of iron 60 deposits lining the world's ocean seabeds, astronomers have high confidence that supernova exploded in Earth's immediate cosmic neighborhood during the transition from the Pliocene epoch to the Ice Age. The supernova blast was so close it littered the ocean floor with the radioactive dust. Scientists estimated the kill zone for a supernova in a paper in 2003, and they came up with about 25 light years from Earth, Malo said. But we think something more like 40 or 50 light years. So an event at 150 light years should have some effects here, but not set off a mass extinction. We live right on the edge of the local bubble in the interstellar medium, says Malo. It's a giant region of about 300 light years long. It's basically very, uh, very hot, very low density gas. Nearly all the but nearly all the gas clouds have been swept out of it. And the best way to manufacture a bubble like this is to have a series of supernova blowing it bigger and bigger. 
But with the local bubble, the cosmic rays kind of bounce off the sides, and the cosmic ray bath would last from 10,000 to 100,000 years. This way, you can imagine a whole series of these things feeding more and more cosmic rays into the local bubble and giving Earth cosmic rays for millions of years. About 2.6 million years ago, an oddly bright light arrived in the prehistoric sky and lingered there for weeks and months. It was a supernova some 150 light years away from Earth. Within a few hundred years, long after the strange light in the sky had dwindled, a tsunami of cosmic energy from that same shattering star explosion could have reached our planet and plummeted into the atmosphere, touching off climate change and triggering mass extinctions of large ocean animals, including the megalodon, a shark species the size of a school bus. Malo said that recent papers revealing ancient seabed deposits of iron-60 isotopes provide the slam-dunk evidence of the timing and the distance of the supernova. According to the team, other evidence for a series of supernova is found in the very architecture of our local universe. Whether or not there was one supernova or a series of them, the supernova energy that spread layers of iron-60 all over the planet also caused penetrating particles called muons to shower the Earth causing cancers and mutations, especially to larger animals. Malo estimated that the cancer rate would go up about 50% for something the size of a human, and the bigger you are, the worse it is. For an elephant or a whale, the radiation dose goes way up. A supernova 2.6 billion years ago may be related to a marine megafaunal extinction at the Pliocene-Pleistocene boundary, where 36% of the genera were estimated to have become extinct. The extinction was concentrated in coastal waters where larger organisms could catch a greater radiation dose from the muons. There hasn't been any really good explanation for the marine megafaunal, megafaunal extinction, but this could be one. This was a paradigm change. We know something happened and when it happened, so for the first time we can really dig in and look for things in a definite way. We can now get really definite about what the effects of radiation would be in a way that wasn't possible before. But the megalodon, think Think, well, imagine the great white shark in, in Jaws, for example, went extinct, perhaps by what Stephen Hawking had so earlier predicted. Val Landy signing off. Please click to subscribe and support us at patreon.com. Thank you, thank you, thank you.